scripture, uh, scripture reading uh, today is Romans 6, verse uh, 22, uh, 23. Sorry. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The second reading is from John 12, verses 23 to 28. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it for, was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Amen. Invite Martin to come up as he will speak to us um, today. I would um, quickly like to pray for you. Lord, we thank you for Martin and we thank you for all the things that you have put on his heart um, to tell us tonight. I pray that you bless him, that you speak um, through him and that you help us to understand what you want to say us, to us tonight. Amen. I couldn't wait to take off the mask. I know today is the final of the uh, Euro 2020. Uh, <laughs> so I promise you that I'll be done before then. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I don't know how to say this without all the English fans throwing rotten eggs on me. Uh, England is in the final and uh, they're about to make history if they win the cup. And so to quote uh, the words of uh, Patrice Evra, he says the last time England won, en won any trophy was when dinosaurs roamed the earth. <laughs> so, no offense, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if, if you're a visitor, or probably you missed the last two weeks, uh, Alex already mentioned in the beginning that we are on the topic of why Jesus came. So two weeks ago, uh, Nick shared with us why Jesus came to give us abundant life. And then last week was Tim, why Jesus came to bring fire. Today, why Jesus came to die. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever messed up in a big way and had someone else cover for you or take the punishment? Think about that. Think of a small child who breaks a, a very expensive vest in a store. Do you think the loving parent would demand that they stay there and work until they are able to pay what is owed? Or do you think the loving parent will willingly pay the price for, uh, for the damage that was done? And this is what Jesus did for us. We deserve the punishment, but he took it upon himself. We are the child, and he is the loving parent. We broke the verse, and he paid the price for it. Now, something similar happened to me. Uh, our eldest child, Mary, she was about two years old, and we were living in Kenya. And we went to, to the mall shopping. And uh, for those who are from Kenya, I'm talking about the Junction Mall, or if you've been to Kenya, 
I'm talking about the Junction Mall. And we went to the supermarket. And Melanie was somewhere in the mall, maybe shopping. And so I went to the, to, to, uh, to the supermarket with Mary, and Mary always stayed with us. As so I went to the aisle, I picked up what I needed to buy, and as I was looking at it, after five seconds, I always see if she's there. And five seconds, I, I turned and she was gone. And I was thinking, well, she can't be far, it's only five seconds. And those who have kids, you know this is a big lie. Five seconds for a two-year-old is, is a lot. A lot can happen within five seconds. But I comforted myself, five seconds, she can't be far from me. So I moved to the next. Next aisle looking for her, she wasn't there. I moved to the next one, she wasn't there. I moved to the next aisle, and this is a huge supermarket. So I went back to the aisle where I was in the beginning, and then I went to the opposite side looking for her, and I could not find her. And I began to get uh, worried and concerned. I said, probably she went to the checkout counters. Maybe she's looking for me there. And so I went there, and there are so many of the counters. She wasn't there. Now, mind you that this was uh, the holiday season. So the supermarket was packed, and the entire mall was packed. She was not there. And I started becoming um, afraid. And see, and all those thoughts are started running through my mind about kids being kidnapped, being abducted, or being stolen. And it was a terrifying thought. And I was so scared. Just the thought of losing my child and never to see her again almost paralyzed me. I was like, where are you? And I remembered within the mall, there's uh, something, uh, a shop called uh, uh, frozen yogurt. And every time we went to the mall, Mary loved frozen yogurts. But it was 50 meters away. So I ran while keep an eye on every person that I passed to see maybe I can find her. I reached the shop and she was not there. See, at this point, I'm beginning to realize that if Mary ended up in the wrong hands, they would be out of the mall by now. I was so scared. And I ran back again to the supermarket. And I was thinking maybe I should go to the command center. Maybe they can announce through the PA. Then a thought came into my mind, go back again to the same aisle where you lost her in the first place. So I went there hoping maybe she went back to look for me and she wasn't there. But then something caught my attention, the breaking of glass in the upstairs, because this supermarket had two, uh, two stories. And then I ran up the stairs and who do I find? There is Mary, walking around as if she owns the whole place. She didn't even realize that she was lost. And in the process of exploring, mind you, she has never done this before. So it's a big surprise for me. She, she tilted um, a coffee table that was made of glass and it all came tumbling down and crashed. But you see, the very sight of her melted my heart. And all the stories that were going through my mind, what could happen to her if she ended up in the wrong hands, just disappeared. Just seeing her was probably the most happiest moment of my life at that time. And I moved towards her, and I could see that the workers there were talking to themselves, asking themselves, whose child is this? And I said, she is mine. I was so happy, she is mine, and I held her. But they said, but you have to pay for what she has broken. I didn't even argue, I said, how much? They told me the price and I paid in cash and they gave me the receipt and I took her home. At that point, I realized that the value of the table cannot be compared to the value of my child. And this is just a vivid picture of what Jesus did for us. We wandered away from him. We're thinking that we know what we are doing and in the process we got lost. And sometimes we don't even realize that we are lost and we ending up breaking. And then Jesus comes looking for us and he pays the price.
for us. So Jesus' death on the cross is known as the atonement. And to atone for something is to make amend or to reconcile. But why did it have to be this way, you ask yourself? I must admit to you, maybe at one point in your life, you even thought could not have been another way for God to pay for our sins other than through death, because I've thought about it too. And not just any other death, but the gruesome death that Jesus had to go through. And a lot of us may have trouble understanding why Jesus had to die for our sins. Not because we don't understand God's holiness, but because we misunderstand our own level of depravity. Now, let me take you to the beginning of how it all happened. Why Jesus came to die. See, when we ask ourselves that question, why did, Jesus, why did Jesus have to die? We must be careful that we are not calling, calling God into questions. To wonder why God couldn't find another way to do something is to imply maybe the way he has chosen is not the best cause of action. And some other method would have been better. And usually what we perceive as better is what we think is right according to us. So before we can come to grips with anything that God does, we first have to acknowledge that his ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. His are higher than ours. And in Deuteronomy 34, 32, 4 reminds us that God is the rock and his works are perfect. And all his ways are just. He's a faithful God who does no wrong. He is upright and just. So therefore, the plan of salvation he has designed, it is perfect, just, and upright. And no one could have come up with anything better. And a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I saw a clip of this scholar who was saying that he had a preacher. And the preacher was saying that if he, the preacher, was God, he would have done it differently. And then the scholar's response to him is, you fool, if you were God, you would have done exactly the same. Because that's what God does. He makes no mistakes. So let's go to the beginning in the Garden of Eden. Now God has created Adam and Eve, he has created all of, all of creation. And he tells Adam, uh, I give you dominion of all creation, take care of it. You can eat anything in the garden except from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what does Adam do? Exactly the same. They put themselves in a vulnerable position to allow Satan to come and to question God's integrity and to question God's words and to make God out to be a liar. Did God really say? You know why? It's because God does not want you to be like him. And this is the problem of sin. We want to be our own gods. And if we are our own gods, then we don't need God. And that is exactly what Satan did. He wanted to be like God and he was cast out. Now he comes with the same lie to human beings. You can be like him. He just doesn't want you to be. And they fall for the lie. And this is the issue of sin. And sometimes I put the question in the bulletin, how we perceive sin determines how we perceive how it is taken care of. So Adam and Eve disobey the Lord and immediately they realize that they were naked. So their disobedience exposed their sin. And you would think that at this particular time, knowing that the Lord told them not to do it, they will say, you know what, we have sinned. Let's run to God and say, we have sinned. Have mercy on us. But what do they do? They cover themselves with leaves. And that's the problem of sin. You commit one sin and you think you can take care of it, so you commit another one to cover the previous one. That doesn't work. You commit another one to cover the previous one. And before you know it, you are in too deep. The leaves are a human solution to a spiritual problem. It does not hold water. A temporal solution to an eternal problem does not work. 
What's the next thing they do? Instead of going back to the Lord, they run away and hide. How can you hide from an all-knowing God who sees everything? See, that's still, that's the lie of the sin, thinking that I can get away with it. These are the implications of sin, and this is the reason why Jesus came. And they go and hide. And then the Lord appears, and of course the Lord knows, so where are you? Oh, we are afraid. Why are you afraid? Did you eat? Adam and Eve are given a perfect opportunity to own up to their sin. And Adam sees the opportunity to blame someone else. And this is the problem of sin. We don't want to own it up. We always want to blame someone else. And then Eve, not to be outdone, blames uh, Satan. You've heard this statement that sin will cost you more than you're willing to pay. And sin will take you farther than you're willing to go. And sin will keep you longer than you're willing to stay. Because God says, on the day you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. And what does death mean? Death means separation. Separation from your soul, the spiritual part of you, from your body, the material part. So on the day you die, you're separated. This goes to decay and into the dust. Separation also means you're separated from God. That's why God says, when you eat of it, you'll surely die. And at that point, God had to drive them out of the garden. Uh, we can go to the next, next slide. For the punishment of sin is death. Why did Jesus have to die? Because the punishment for sin is death. Romans 3.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. For in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. But here is the, is the beauty of, of God's love. Even though they deserve to die and to be cast out of the garden, God gave them hope and reconciliation. What does the Lord do? God says, you know, these leaves don't work. So the Lord goes ahead and kills an animal and takes the garment of the animals and he clothes them. And this is the beginning of the, the process of salvation. God pointing out to the coming of the Messiah who's going to be the sacrificial lamb for our sins. So we see the aspect of the innocent dying for the guilty. We see an innocent animal in the garden. And then we see Adam and Eve as the guilty ones. And so the Lord sheds blood and takes the, uh, the garment of skin and covers them. It gives us the picture of Christ who will eventually, by the shedding of blood, because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins, but also he will give us his garment of righteousness. So that one day, when God looks at us, he will see us washed clean by the blood of the Lamb, and also he will see us covered by the garment of righteousness. So he looks at me through the eyes of his son. So it is pointing to the coming of the Messiah that he will die on our behalf, just like the lamb in the garden had to give up its life so that Adam and Eve could be covered. At the same time, before the Lord drove them out as a form of punishment, he also drove them out as a form of love and mercy. And you say, love and mercy? Yes, because in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, allow me to read it. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might even stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. See, driving Adam and Eve from the garden was both a punishment and an act of mercy lest they should eat of the tree of life and live forever in a state of death and alienation. 
Meaning if, see the issue of sin I'm talking about, you always do the next one to cover. If I allow them to stay here, they may reach out and eat from the tree of life. And when they do that, they will be eternally condemned in that state of death and alienation forever. So God chasing them out is like, you go out. I will start another process to redeem you back to myself. So God loves us and cares for us. Let's go to the next slide. Where did Jesus have to die? It's to give us life. Now we read the text about Jesus saying, unless the kernel of a, what is it called? Wheat, the seed, unless it falls into the ground and dies, there will be no life coming up. Remember, for the wages of sin is death. Death is the price to pay for sins. And so God is saying, for the death to be overcome, another death must, must uh, take place. And so Jesus says, unless the seed dies, and we see the moment of dying and then the tree coming up. We see the same uh, symbol with baptism. You go down like I'm dead to my sins and alive in Christ. Now, I was trying to remember uh, all the lessons I learned about agriculture in primary school and high school. Because Jesus here is giving us an agricultural analogy, actually a scientific one. It took so many... <laughs> A very long time for scientists to be able to understand what goes under the soil. But here is Jesus giving it so simple. Unless a seed dies, there will be no life. And so I went to check the diagram of a, of a seed. And the simple one, and those who are scientists here, you can correct me if I'm wrong. A simple seed has the outer skin and then it has the bigger part, which is called the endosperm, and then you have the embryo. And it's amazing what Jesus said here, how much sense it makes. You see, the endosperm must die and give up its contents in order to support life, in order to regenerate the dying seed. If the endosperm refuses to give up itself and support the developing embryo, there could not be a new life springing up from the dying seed. I found that very amazing. And you can observe seeds that have not germinated after several days of planting. When observed closely, the seed is often found rotten. This is the case of the endosperm refusing to give up its life to support the embryo. Another thing that happens to the, embryo, uh, to the endosperm is that it's not only willing to give up itself, but is also willing to be broken down from a complex biochemical substance to a simple substance. That Jesus was not only willing to take your penalty and my penalty of death, but he was willing to humble himself and fashion himself to become like you and I. From the complex, the God of glory living in the heavens, to come down, just like the seed being broken down from the complex to the simple, to live a simple life just uh, like you and I. You see, new life cannot begin to develop unless the dying process in the old self precedes the new life. So when Jesus died on our behalf, the work of the flesh and the old nature was nailed to the cross when Jesus died. As Paul said, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has gone, the new has come. See, the endosperm did all that was necessary for the embryo to form a new life, and to become biologically productive in the life of the plant. Jesus has done all that is necessary for us to be spiritually reproducing individuals. I die that you might have life and have it more abundantly. In finishing, You see, God has forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. We are told about that in Colossians chapter 2. God says, because of the death of Jesus, which was absolutely necessary, I forgive you. I 
As far as east is from the west, I have forgiven you. I have taken all your sins from the day you were born until the day you die, and I've covered them with my own blood, and I've thrown them into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be counted again. I have forgiven you. It is a terrifying thought for me. And I don't think even any human language can be able to describe if Jesus had not died for us. I have forgiven you. So that in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us, Lord, as we forgive others. Do not carry that luggage again. Lay down at the feet of the cross. You are forgiven. It's like you being on a death row. And then the Lord says, I will exchange with my son. He will take the execution on your behalf. You are free to come up into the open society and live with anyone else. But that's just not enough. I am going to erase your record so that as if you had not done it in the first place. That's what the blood of Jesus does. It cleanses you completely. So if you do not know this forgiveness, today is your chance. Today is the day of salvation. And the Lord has died for you to forgive you for your sins. But also if you are here and you are forgiven, but you still struggle with forgiving other people, the Lord is saying, if I have forgiven you for all that you have done, and what you've done to me cannot be compared to what the other person has done to you, then you need to let go. Forgive, having an unforgiving heart is poison, and someone said it's like you drinking the poison and you expect the other person to die. It only affects you. If the Lord has forgiven you, then you have the right to forgive the next person. Love your enemies and do good to them. Bless those who persecute you. So today, if there's any grudge in your heart, again, it's someone else. Whether it's in the family or in the workplace, God is saying, let it go. I have forgiven you. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Because the power of sin is broken now, you don't have to be under the power of it anymore. You don't have to be under the power of alcohol. You do not have to be under the power of drugs. You don't have to be under the power of pornography. You don't have to be under the power of your hot temper. Anything. You don't have to be under the power of sin. Under the power of any person or anything. Why? Because Jesus purchased you. And you're free. Whoever the son sets free, he is free indeed. Jesus has purchased your freedom at Calvary. And he finished our salvation. It is done. It is paid for. It is bought. You don't need to add anything to it. It is a gift to you. If you put your faith in Jesus, you can say with confidence, I know for certainty that my sins are forgiven. So Jesus suffered and died to cancel the legal demands against us. There is no salvation by balancing of records. There is only salvation by cancelling of records. You and I had a lot of debts that we could never repay, but Jesus took care of it. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Christ's death puts beyond all doubt the fact that God loves us. It assures us that no matter what life throws at us, we can trust that he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, he will also graciously give us all things. God is saying, if I give up my son to die for you, what else can I hold back from giving it to you? The ultimate expression of God's love for you was Jesus hanging on the cross. It doesn't get better than that. He has taken the sting of death from us. And you know this uh, illustration of uh, the little boy and his father were driving down a country road on a beautiful spring afternoon. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a bumblebee flew into the car window. Since the little boy was deathly allergic to bee stings, he became petrified. His father quickly reached out, grabbed the bee, squeezed it in his hand, and then released it. But as soon as he let it go, the young son became frantic once again as the bee buzzed by. The father sensed his son's tail. Once again, he reached out his hand, but this time he pointed his hand to his son and says, Look, 
they are stuck in his skin was the sting of the bee. You see this? He told his son, you don't need to be afraid anymore. I've taken the sting for you. He can't bite you anymore. The Christian does not need to be afraid of death because Christ has taken the sting out of death and sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. He who the Son sets free, he is free indeed. And now God is calling us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Because Jesus said, I died. I became the dead sacrifice and rose from the dead. Now you become a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. Now let me finish with the story of George Mueller. Now when a man asked George Mueller the secret of his service... Mueller responded, there was a day when I died, utterly died. Died to George Mueller, his opinions, his preferences, his tests, and his will. Died to the world, its approval or censure. Died to the approval or blame, even of my brethren and friends. And since then, I've started to show myself approved only to God. Are you living in an abundant life? Is there anything holding you back from living that kind of life? Is there any luggages that you're carrying that you don't need to carry because Christ has already paid for that? Maybe today is the day where you lay them down because less is more. The less you lay down at the feet of Christ, the freer you become. It's not worth it. Jesus has died to set you free. Then we need to live as free people. Is it forgiveness? Unforgiveness? Is there a habit, a sin holding you back? Are you committing more sins to cover the previous sins? Jesus said, I have taken care of that. You don't need to hide. Come to me and I will set you free. May the Lord help us. Lord, let's pray. Lord, thank you. And, and thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. That we can be free. That we can be reconciled back to God. Father, if there's anything that is holding us back from living the life of victory, may you point it out to us and may we lay down at your feet tonight. If there's any person who here who has never experienced the life-changing grace of God, may you set him free or her free tonight. Thank you for what you did for us on the cross. There's absolutely nothing we can do to repay you. All we can do is to live a life of worship, pointing people to the amazing love and grace that is found in Christ Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.